Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to the Hockey Think Tank podcast brought to you by the HockeyThinkTank.com, a website for all players, parents, and coaches to go to get a little bit of education and a little bit of inspiration regarding the greatest game on the planet. What an episode we have for you guys here today. We are turning back time. And we are re-airing a conversation that we had over YouTube with two of the top coaches in the NCAA Division I hockey. We have Brad Berry with North Dakota and Mike Schaefer with Cornell. And during COVID, obviously, there was a, a lot of Zoom stuff that was going on. And so I reached out to both Brad and to, to Schaefe and asked them because the year before that, they were the co-recipients of the Spencer Penrose award, which is the top coach in college hockey and both, uh, obviously both programs, historic programs, always typically up there in the top 10, uh, programs in the country. And, uh, this was just a phenomenal conversation. Uh, so on YouTube, we called it 10 questions. So I asked them 10 specific questions about their programs, about how they coach, about how they relate to players and things like that. And uh, it was just really cool to hear two legends in the game kind of go back and forth and, and talk about how they built their culture, how they built their programs, how they see hockey development. And uh, yeah, we figured we would take that conversation, put it in audio form. You obviously can go to our YouTube page and, and check it out there. Um, but it is coming out audio wise here on the podcast podcast here today. So fantastic conversation with both Brad and with Shafe. But before we get over to those guys, let's bring on the talent of the podcast. A one Jeffrey J who Zoolander Lavecchio Vex male model. How you doing guys? It's part of my life. I just found out that I'm flying out to Denver tomorrow for a little photo shoot with my wife it's literally just her photo shoot and they asked me to come and maybe stand in the background but it's part of my life <laughs> you know it's like my 17th umpteenth modeling gig but whatever it's part of my life guys okay i'm just happy to be on the podcast with you guys happy to be here with my cousin topher well one of us has to have a face for podcasts <laughs> you're, you're the guy's got the face for for the ig for the gram there we uh, go baby myself podcast extraordinaire there we go yeah. It's all right, baby. We all got our strengths, you know. You, you got. The, <laughs> He's like, I agree with you. Actually, you, you are the, definitely a podcast face. So <laughs> you got the hockey IQ. I got the Greek god bod. You know, it's <laughs> part of our life. All right, it is what it is. We play to our strengths. You graduated from an Ivy League. I didn't even graduate. <laughs> so <laughs> what's I'm that? What's that scene in Billy you're Madison? Smart. <laughs> yeah, say, what's that you're scene? Good, uh, you're good. No you're, attra you're attractive. I'm not very good looking. Okay, enough. <laughs> <laughs> when he's talking to chubs that was yeah. unreal yeah <laughs> what a, what a um but yeah i'm i'm really excited to bring this conversation to everybody it, it was just a really really cool conversation how how often do you get the chance to to speak to two people at the absolute top of their field uh both extremely smart guys both extremely passionate guys um and i think a, a lot of people are going to get a lot out of this particularly coaches but also people that are are fans of north dakota fans of cornell get a little bit of a, a sneak peek inside the curtain of, of kind of how they built their programs and what's important to them, what they believe in. And uh, man, it's just like, and you know this, we talk about it all the time, like just having the opportunity to speak to people who are smarter than you, <laughs> having the opportunity to, to really develop yourself personally, professionally, just man, it, it means so much to, to us. And, and that's like a whole basis of the podcast, right? Like we want to bring people on that can provide a perspective that can help us be the best versions of ourselves and be the best that we can be. And, and these two guys are certainly a big part of it. Um, I don't know Brad Berry that well. I've ran into him obviously a, a bunch of different times through co through uh, college hockey stuff. Uh, played for Shave, coach with Shave, still keep in touch with Shave and do some stuff with them, particularly doing our charity game at Cornell, uh, you know, every summer. And man, like just a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of passion. And I think a lot of people are going to get a lot out of this. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that we're bringing it over from youtube to to this format so more people can hear it you know i think it's going to be an important conversation and like you said like you know you don't you don't head up programs like this especially shave's been you know these guys been doing it forever like it's not 95 it's not, it's not, <laughs> 1995 right it's not an accident and if for any reason at all shave is listening to this remember what i said at tove's wedding 
<laughs> well, enlighten our listeners about what you said to, to all of our coaches that I invited to my wedding. <laughs> so I was the best man at Tove's wedding. Tove got married when he was like 18. So, um, you know, I'd never, not quite. <laughs> it was close. I'd never been, uh, never been a best man. Obviously, we was super young. What were you, 23, 22? Yeah, I was like two years out of college. Yeah, so he's pretty young. <laughs> They were cold, it's like 23. So I'd never even been in a wedding. Um, and I was the best man. So I gave my best man speech. And to finish the speech, um, all the all three Cornell coaches were there. And I said, uh, and by the way, I know all the Cornell coaches are here sitting in the back. I am not upset that you never recruited me to play hockey at Cornell with my cousin Tove here, but uh, I will be on the dance floor all night dancing with all three of your wives. <laughs> and the crowd <laughs> erupted. <laughs> That was awesome. That was a phenomenal best man speech. Good job. Good job. Good job. Uh, Yeah. So that was a really good one. And um, yeah, a lot of, a lot of fun things are going on right now for the hockey think tank too. Like just this, this organization blueprint that we rolled out a couple weeks ago. I'm I'm getting calls and emails daily from, from youth organizations, presidents, hockey directors, coaches, parents, and what, you know, what does it entail and, and, and how can we get it? (laughs) And so we're really excited about that. And and guys, guys, Vex and I have Ooh. something up our sleeve right now. We can't quite talk about it yet. We can't quite talk about it yet, but this is going to take the Hockey Think Tank podcast to the next level. It is going to be unbelievable about like, and again, I am looking forward to this so much. And uh, my daughter Paige just came in. Hello, Paigey. Love you. It is past your bedtime. Good night. You want to say hello really quick? Paigey girl, say hello really quick. Hey. Hello. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Back to bed, bud. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Paige, for that uh, interruption. Appreciate that. And also she sent me a note. Actually, this is funny because I have to say something really quick. Um, oh, <laughs> so sweet. She just passed me a note. You can see it here if you're on YouTube. And so it says, your podcasts are the best podcast I've ever heard. Love, Paige. Oh. <laughs> That's unbelievable. You know, it's actually really funny. So I'm I'm kind of battling a little bit of a sickness here right now. And uh, so Paigey, she's very thoughtful and she made me tea. She's just like made me tea out of nowhere. And it's like, hey, just here's some tea. And so it was so kind. So like as I was putting her to bed, I was like, Paigey, that was so thoughtful. Like, thank you so much for, you know, for that tea. And then she goes, oh, you're welcome, daddy. And uh, (laughs) but but then (laughs) anybody with kids knows. (laughs) Uh, she goes, daddy, did you know Santa's watching everything that I'm doing right now? <laughs> so I'm like, Oh, okay. Was that tea out of the goodness of your heart? Or do you just want good presents from Santa? Okay. Uh, I get, I get what's going on right now. I love it. That's <laughs> and, awesome. Uh, I might milk this though. This is like the cutest note ever. Here, here yeah. it is for our YouTube listeners. Again, your oh. podcasts are the best podcast I've ever heard in her six year old spelling <laughs> yeah. podcast. That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, um, I was. Uh, I gave a. I gave a speech last night. I work with um, the St. Louis Rockets uh, here in St. Louis. Um, they have an off ice facility, and and uh, I took it over, running their programming. And I have a coach in there who works with all the players. I've been there a couple times. And last night I gave a speech um, for like it's probably like four hundred people that wound up coming. Um, right. I did three separate speeches, and the last one, this guy comes up to me and he's like, "Hey, Jeff." Great to meet you. I've been listening to the podcast for two years. My girls cross country team at a private girls high school here won the state championship last year. And a lot of what you guys talk about on the podcast, I've implemented into the team. So thank oh, no you. Way. Yeah. And we talked for a while and I asked his son, his son listens to every podcast with his dad. And I was like, dude, thank you so much for telling me that. Like you were exactly why we do this like you and your son listen to the podcast together and like they were asking different questions about episodes and stuff it's just really 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 cool so um great meeting you sir i know you're listening can't wait to come back and speak again there that is the best part about this podcast is being able to connect with people like that last night i did a, a parent zoom call with uh teams for the pittsburgh penguins elite the triple a program out there in pittsburgh and same thing like i got a couple emails and a couple instagram dms from parents that listen to the podcast we're like so cool to see you and same thing 
thing happened tonight. I talked with the coaches for St. Albert uh, Minor Hockey Association up in St. Albert, Alberta. And um, yeah, like one of the coaches like reached out, was like, hey, like really appreciate all the stuff that you do. And so um, that like, honestly, like the best part about this podcast is being able to connect with awesome hockey people from around the world. And thank you guys so much for supporting our podcast, continuing to listen, sharing us with your groups and stuff like that, because we get so validated by by getting that feedback with what we're doing. Our, our mission, our goal with doing this thing is just to make a huge positive impact on the hockey hockey world. And, uh, and when people in, in come up to us and, and talk to us about things like that, man, that just like hits the feels, it hits the feels a lot. Dude, every time, every time. And it just like gets me even more excited to get on the podcast and like just dig deep into my brain and all those crevasses in there and try and give you as many <laughs> nuggets of knowledge as I've uh, learned throughout the years. Oh, and sometimes I can't take you seriously, and it's the best part. Dude, the fact <laughs> that you didn't laugh in the intro when I was doing the ball on the head thing, I don't know how you didn't <laughs> laugh. Anybody on YouTube is like, what is happening? You were stone cold. I was trying to make you break there. That's the that's the cool thing about these being up on YouTube now is, number one, Steph, our podcast producer, does an unbelievable job of making yeah, it she does. really cool. Really, really uh, cool. It's <laughs> yeah. a good thing, by the way, that I don't have control of that. That's I, actually a very good thing. A whole episode. Yes, yes. Um, but also, like for for all the listeners out there, every time I do an intro, Vex is trying to make me laugh and trying to like cut me up. <laughs> and so sometimes I'm just like not even looking at the screen, or I'm just like overly focused, just trying to. We've done it. We're almost at 300 episodes now, right? So wow. it's uh, it's almost like second nature now. I can do it in my sleep. But yeah, it's uh, yeah, the, you're you're goof. I love it. <laughs> Um, but with that, uh, we want to get over to this awesome conversation with, uh, Brad and with Shafe. But before we do, we got some people to thank. First want to thank our title sponsor, gel sticks, go to G E L S T X.com gel sticks.com. Unbelievable weighted training aids. Again, it is holiday season. If you're looking for a great present for your son, your daughter, or whoever it may be that is looking to work on their shot, fantastic present. So if you use the coupon code think tank one word, you will get a nice little discount on your weighting training sticks. Go, go to G E L S T X.com today. Vex guys, such a good Christmas present. I'm telling you as a strength and conditioning coach, um, and, and knowing like about biomechanics and movement and stuff like that. I love the gel stick because it also teaches your players like how to flex a stick too. Um, because it's a little bit heavier. So like it kind of teaches them how to push down into it because when that stick is three times the weight, puck's not going anywhere unless they actually use the technology of the stick and like push in and use the flex. So I really, really do believe in gel sticks. Um, also want to thank uh, Train Heroic. Train Heroic is the awesome app that allows me to train the thousands of hockey players a year that I do. Moms and dads out there, you know, don't be afraid to join my online training. Toph's dad, actually, Uncle Bob, who has been on the podcast, is training with me online right now. I talked to him over Thanksgiving. He said, oh, I got to get back in. I said, let's go, baby. Let's go. I can help you. Boom. This was week one, and he's slaying it. And, uh, uh, or actually week two, sorry, and he's slaying it. So if any parents out there want to figure out, you know, how to get in better shape, you can go to my website, gmbm.com. It is nasty. Uh, you can see a bunch of the players I work with, uh, uh, interviews from them, and uh, choose from different online programs. Or you can reach out to me and I can build one out for you specifically. So Train Heroic allows me to do that. So thank you, Train Heroic. You have helped change my life and uh, work with so many people that I never would have had the chance to. Also want to say thank you to Cure Nutrition. Cure Nutrition is a CBD company that I'm with. Uh, I talk about all the time, guys. I've been taking CBD since my last year pro, um, 2017, 2018. I take CBD twice a day, every single day to keep my brain functioning well and to help with recovery from all the stressors that we all have in life. So if you have any questions, please reach out to me on what, why, how CBD stuff like that. I had to get a certification through this other CBD company when I was learning about it at first. And I, I got taught so much about it and uh, the endocannabinoid system in our body and things like that. So if you have questions, please reach out or just go to curednutrition.com and use my discount code GMBM. Boom. And thank you to Helios Hockey, an unbelievable product that we have partnered with for the podcast here right now and 
for some other things you'll hear about in a little bit too. But uh, Healers Hockey, unbelievable company, unbelievable product. So what you do is you get this sensor that you put in your shoulder pads. And what this sensor does is it pairs up with whatever video you're using. It could be live barn. It could be an iPad. It could be a camera, whatever it may be. And it will live in time give you feedback on your game, uh, particularly with your stride and your stride mechanics, particularly with your effort level and, and how much you're putting into, uh, you know, the, the game. And it's really cool because they call it a hustle score. It's really, really neat for kids. I think they take it really seriously. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but also it cuts up your shifts for you at the end of the day, so much value. It pairs up with the video. It cuts up your shifts for you. So directly right after a game, you have all of your shifts right there. And what an unbelievable teaching tool you can use with that. It's just an absolute time saver to be able to do that. If I had this when I was a kid, that's like all I would have done was be like just on my phone, like just like watching my shifts. And so uh, go to helioshockey.com. And if you use the coupon code, again, think tank one word, it will give all new Helios members 20% off their initial 12 month membership. And you will get that sensor that I was talking about that goes in your shoulder pad to make it work. You'll get that for free. So uh, an unbelievable discount there. Go to helioshockey.com for that. And also thank you. Thank you. Thank you to icehockeysystems.com. The best website out there for everything coaching education and unbelievable website, thousands of drills on there, whiteboard explanations from really, really high level hockey people. It's just such a great tool. And honestly, like if there's any hockey directors listening to this, this would be like, honestly, like the best present to get your coaches because like you can get this with a partnership that we've created with ice hockey systems for every coach in the organization. So you have access to all those drills and whiteboard explanations, but you can also put in practice plans, draw drills digitally up on the screen, uh, share those drills, share your practice plans with coaches within your organization. You can build up drill libraries, practice plan libraries, um, just like tailored towards your, your, your hockey club. And it's just a phenomenal, phenomenal tool. And also if you do get the associations platform that we've partnered with them with, you will get access to the hockey think tank parent survival guide. So not only are the coaches going to benefit from this, but the parents are going to benefit from it as well. Um, just an unbelievable value add. So if there are any hockey directors um, or any board members of, of youth organizations that are listening to this, honestly, I don't think there's any greater present that you can give to your association than an ice hockey systems platform for all your coaches. Uh, so go to ice hockey systems, look up the association platform today and, uh, and get that for your coaches. And last but not least, Thank you, thank you, thank you to all of our amazing, amazing, amazing listeners. We love you guys so incredibly much. And uh, we just appreciate all the feedback that we get, like we were talking about at the beginning of the episode, or beginning of this intro. And, uh, you know, thank you so much for sharing us. Thank you so much for, you know, all the positive feedback. Thank you so much so much for helping us to spread the positive word and helping us on our mission to create some positive change in, in the youth hockey and the professional uh, higher level hockey worlds. And, uh, you know, we just, we just appreciate you so much. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are absolutely going to love this podcast episode. It is a 10 questions on YouTube that we did with these guys a couple of years ago during COVID. And so without further ado, be ready to be wowed by a couple unbelievable hockey guys in university of North Dakota, head coach, Brad Berry and Cornell University head coach, Mike Schaefer. All right, what an honor to have two of the top coaches in college hockey today and all time, <laughs> all on one interview here, both uh, Cornell and North Dakota having just incredible seasons this year. And unfortunately, they were cut short by this coronavirus, but uh, very, very honored to have both of you on, Coach Barry, Coach Schaefer. Um, appreciate it very much so. No problem, Tover. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Topher. It's great to be here. All right, cool. Let's let's dive right into it. And one of the things that I love to do, um, you know, typically when I would go down to Florida when we had our college coaching convention, I would try to seek out a coach uh, that that won at some level during the year and just ask them why. You know, what was it about this specific team that allowed you guys to win a championship and, and be so successful? So, Coach Barry, maybe I'll start with you first. You know, is there something in particular, maybe one or two things about this group that you guys had this year that really made it so special? Well, I think, yeah, I think uh, that's a great question. I think there's a couple of things. I think, uh, you know, I, I alluded to you a little bit before we talked here. Uh, that's not making the national tournament a couple of years in a row. And, you know, we have a, 
a junior class this year that experienced that over their first two years here. And, and that's something that normally we make that tournament and have a chance to win. And, and they didn't get to experience that. And they were pretty influential players on our team skill wise. And uh, I think it was pretty neat. They talked together, guys like Jordan Kawaguchi and Colin Adams, and Grant Mishmash, Matt Kirsten. They talked together about, you know, hey, we got to be better and, and we got to make an impact. We got to take the reins as upperclassmen here. So those guys took a step. And then we brought in some pretty good freshmen here with a kid named Shane Pinto from Long Island, New York. But, you know, you never know how it goes for freshmen, but he had a pretty good freshman year here. And, and then us coaches, you know, we knew we had to get better in some of the details and different things that we had to do to keep moving here. And uh, so I think that collectively as a group, it was uh, a challenge to all of us to try to get better. That's great. Shape, how about you? Yeah, Brad, stay out of uh, Long Island, man. All right. <laughs> stay out of Long Island. You stay, you stay outside of oh, oh, past Michigan, you know, Lake Michigan. Okay, if you, right? stay, if you, you stay out of BC, we'll stay out of Long Island. All right. All right. All bets are off. Um, you know, it, it, I think that Brad talks about right away is, is players. I mean, the kind of the players' attitudes. And you, we can say all we want as a coaching staff about where we want to get to and how we want to get there. But I think it really comes down to the, the character of the players and their drive of wanting to succeed. And, and for us, that's been an ongoing process. And to have the kind of year we had, I think that uh, I think that, that stems from you know that culture that exists within our, our program. That has to do a lot with what uh, you know recruiting and bringing the right kind of kid that's going to play in our, our program and uh, want to play selfless. And I think the second part is that facing that adversity from previous years, like what Brad talked about, is that I think. You know, in all different programs, we face that adversity in different ways. And for us, um, I think the guys you knew how tenuous the, the, the previous season was where we had a lot of injuries, uh, but we never really accomplished the goals that we wanted to accomplish, even though we got in the NCAA tournament and we got to a game within the Frozen Four. Um, we didn't really finish, the, finish it. And, we, and that kind of was our model for this year was to, to finish things. And, and unfortunately, things get, get uh, swept away. But you know, losing in the championship goal uh, game against uh, um, against Clarkson, um, you know, losing two of our better players in that game and Jeff Malott and, and Matt Glide, and then the following weekend, uh, you know, playing against Northeastern but not getting past it. So I think those are the keys for us is that, uh, you know, our season was uh, really driven by our players and their, their want to be more consistent. That's that's great. And you guys both mentioned adversity as a huge piece of of getting over that hump this year. And Shafe, I was around. We had a couple tough years together and we really sat down as a staff and really kind of charted the way forward in terms of who we wanted to be as a team culture wise, recruiting philosophies and just kind of put everything out on the table. And it sounds, Coach Barry, like you guys had a similar similar type of experience at North Dakota, not making the tournament for two years. So when you guys go back and you look at that time when you reevaluated the program and needed to change some things, Shape, I'll start with you first. What was that experience like and how much do you think just kind of taking a step back and reevaluating led to the success that you guys are having today? Yeah, I think that the four or five years ago, there's a lot of transition, how the game was being played. Uh, I think recruiting was, is in a transitional period about, you know, kid grabbing kids when they were young. Um, you know, it, it was a, it was a very, very transitional time. And, and, um, you know, so going out and finding kids was transitional. Um, how the game I think was being played at the college level was, was, was changing. And, you know, we decided we had to change and, and you know, for us in recruiting, I'll go back on the recruiting aspect that we changed by, you know, going back and starting to take uh, late, late bloomers, guys that had a chip on their shoulder, guys that were passed over and maybe in their different areas, but also, going back into the areas that, uh, and, and not committing to kids until we actually saw it with our eyes and stopped going with potential and uh, started to see them as players. And I think that was the first one. And, and, and the second one was to just put a little bit more emphasis on and not thinking that we could develop everybody. I think part of our talent, and you know, we thought and over the years was to bring kids in and develop them as hockey players. And then we had to, it took a little shot to the Eagle is that, uh, you know, we need to kind of really see that for ourselves, you know, not just seeing a bigger kid that, we thought we could mold, but rather than making sure that they have the size, speed, and skill, hockey sense, and spirit that all kind of, you know, map us as a program. And, and uh, by making that change and, and putting more emphasis on the speed, but also changing some of our systems so that we could play faster. Um, that was a, not a scary time, but it, it, it was a time that I had become more uncomfortable as a coach because, you know, we'd had so much success for so long doing it one way. And then uh, we went kind of went changed and went back and did something different. And 
hasn't changed a whole lot, but it definitely has changed. Yeah, yeah. How about you, Coach? Yeah, I think Shafe hit it right on the head there. I think, obviously, that changing uh, the way you do things uh, constantly to think outside the box a little bit. I think, you know, one thing about college is, especially when, you know, you have your players up to four years, sometimes you become stagnant in a lot of the ways you think. And, you know, just because you have a little bit of success, you know, doesn't mean that you have to keep doing the things the same way. I think, like everybody else, uh, people embrace change and, and they like to shake it up a little bit here. And, you know, I, I go back to, I think it was two or three years ago, uh, you know, we go out of Buffalo, New York for, you know, all those uh, U.S. development camps for, for young athletes going out there in the summertime. And I can remember when Shafe uh, called me and he called a bunch of head coaches from around the country and he said, hey, you know, we got some time in between sessions here. Why don't we all get together and brainstorm and really be open and talk about what programs do on and off the ice. And I thought that was very, very impactful. I know it was for me. And I think it's one of those things that as a coach, you have to be open on, on trying to learn from others. It doesn't matter how much experience you have, but, you know, try to grow as a, go, grow as a coach over the years, because I'll tell you what, when you think you, you, you know it all, you really don't. And uh, I think players actually uh, love it that, you know, you're human and the fact that you want to get better as well as they do. So, I think it's one of those things that, uh, you know, it, it ever evolves, whether it's coaching or recruiting, that you have to change your ways and adapt to the times. Yeah, for sure. And what are some things that you, I know both of you guys are very into that in terms of being lifelong learners and having relationships with people around the business that can make you better. You know, what are some things that you guys do for your own coaching development that maybe some coaches watching here can implement in their own careers? Shape, we'll start with you. Well, coaching development, I, I, I go back to what Brad said. I mean, is, is that, uh, you know, for me, I, um, going right back and, and just continuing to learn. And, you know, uh, you know we were up at, uh, in Buffalo and, and had that opportunity to sit down with, with uh, uh, Norm Bazan and a couple other coaches. And, and just, you know, I think the, the drills are one thing. I mean, it's, it's, it, everybody can see drills. I mean, you, you can walk into a rink and see how a team practices and, one of the things that we talked about with Brad and those guys and that thing was, yeah, but what are you emphasizing? Like what, what is, what's the, the nitty gritty on your, you know, for, for you to demand because everybody's got their own mark on their team. And uh, so I think that's one is, is not just the drills, but you know, what, what makes a, a North Dakota so good? What makes a, a UMass Lowell so good? And so that's one, I think, you know, it's hard for coaches, but you know, having connections, Jeff Blashill, uh, and, and Dave Quinn, the last two years, I've got an opportunity to go to Detroit and, and the Rangers and just sit back and watch guys and how they're dealing with professionals. Because I think it was, a, it was big to be able to talk to our players about, you know, what they're doing is the exact same thing that we're doing. They're developing, they're getting better, and, and the grass isn't greener on the other side. And, and they're doing the exact same things, but they're doing it a little bit differently. And, and, uh, and that, that, so that's another one. I, you know, for me, I think that uh, – you know, sitting down and really we're just reflecting about, you know, uh, the, the last major part of the coaching development aspect of it is just relationships and just trying to get better and better and better at, at you know, dealing with our players and, and having a deeper relationship with our, our guys on our team. And, you know, that's, uh, you know, as something over the last three years is that I've really tried to accomplish more as a head coach is just delving deeper into what makes kids tick, not, not just, the, you know, um, having surface conversations, you know, having real conversations, you know, and uh, I think that that has uh, helped uh, our staff become a better coaching staff and, and getting to know our players on a deeper level. And, and um, so that coaching development, I, I says, I think those are the three areas for us. I think that we've, we've tried to become a better coaching staff. Love that. How about you, Coach Barry? Yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll mimic everything that Chief says there. I think one thing that we really try to strive and I think change – in a lot of different ways over the past few years is connectivity or the communication side within coaching. Uh, you know, it seems like everybody is detailed X's and O's, whether it's, you know, the video pre-scout, you know, everybody knows what everybody else is doing. You know, everybody, <clears throat> excuse me, everybody has an identity on how they want to play within their system and structure. So, you know, you got to get through that the first, you know, month or two to get everything down and then everybody pretty much knows it. But I think what has to be growing and building the whole year is, is your connectivity and communication with players and building relationships because that's a big deal. And, and the, even though I, I, you know, Shafe and I, you know, we're getting up there in age a little bit, probably me a little bit more older than anybody. But uh, I think, you know, young people coming in now from all walks of life with different things going on in their lives, you really got to deep pull the layers back on them and, and see what makes them tick. And I think at the, at the end of the root of it all is they have to know that you care. 
And I think, uh, you know, it, it, the biggest thing is, is if a player knows that, you know, you got his back and you know he cares, you know, whether it's on ice or off ice, uh, they're going to go through the wall for you. And, uh, you know, that's a big deal. And, and you have to try to start building that early. And that's one thing I've noticed is, yeah, everybody wants to get through the X's and O's and be sharp and detailed, and, and that's what you want to be. But I think at the end of the day, you know, you have to really dig into the individual side with all the different players. And that's why, like us as, as, as coaches, we have to make sure that we delegate and we have opportunities to do that. And one of the things that we do here is, uh, you know, before in, in the old days, the head coach ran the practice practices, all the, all the drills, and the assistant coaches pushed the pucks. And, and now it, it has to be uh, delegated where, you know what, the head coach, you, you run two or three drills, meet the, probably the meat of the practice, and the other coaches run the other drills, and you kind of share it. But that gives the head coach an opportunity to kind of go in lines and talk to players and, and you know, whether it's sharpen their details on the ice, but also talk to them personally on a, on a, a one-to-one level of what makes them tick. And I think that's a big, big deal. If you have a, a leeway to not just run the drills, but kind of see what goes in behind the scenes of a player on and off the ice. Yeah. Coach, how much do you think that delving into the relationship, relationship side of things has helped you to become a better coach just in terms oh. of knowing your players more? Well, two ways. Like first, it, it, it know, the player knows that you care in the first thing and, and, and whether that's on ice or off ice. And, uh, and that, you know, he has a trust within you to come to you. Because I'll tell you one thing, especially when the, the age uh, disparity gets a little bit higher and, and, you know, I'm getting older and, you know, the players are getting younger coming in here, that you have, to, you have to bridge that gap and you have to know that, hey, you know, this guy, I can trust this guy going to him. If I have a problem, I can go to this guy instead of just holding it in. Um, so, you know, building that trust factor. But for me, you know, it, it's, 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 it's also me trying to get better and being on the same level as them because one thing that we try never to do is have that line in the sand and say, hey, you know, the players, you're on one side of it and the coaches, you're on the other. And, and as soon as you get rid of that line, uh, and again, there has to be some, you know, concepts as far as structure and, and uh, you know, hierarchy as far as leadership. But as far as, uh, you know, being in it together, we have a saying here, it's we, us, and our. Uh, it's not I, me, or you. It's we, us, and our, and everything that we do, and that's a big, big deal. And our, our, I think our players feel that. That's really cool. And Shafe, how about you? How has that kind of changed in your coaching career, and how much do you feel like getting to know your players has helped you as a coach? I don't. I don't think it's changed a whole lot in in my coaching career. I mean, I think that uh, it's been relatively the same. I think. I think that uh, you know, uh, the issue, issues are a little bit more uh, blurred and. Again, I think I go back to it, uh, you know, probably, um, again, probably four or five, six years ago, you know, I think that uh, just sitting down and saying that, you know, um, relationships, you know, I think that uh, it was, I got tired of hearing as a coach that, you know, um, you know, social media, this and, and the different things that kids were different, you know, and I kind of got tired of it as a coach, um, you know, a few years ago. And, and I just was like, you know, you know, I got to go back to doing the things that I've always done. And, you know, relationships have, have always been the, you know, the strength, I think, of our program between our players and between our players and our coaching staff. And um, I, I wasn't as accepting of the, of the social media aspect of it that maybe some other coaches are. And, and you know, just trying to find out what, what is preventing, you know, our players from reaching. I think, you know, every, every person, including myself, you know, you have something that's holding you back, you know, from really kind of reaching your potential. And, you know, and I think that, you know, that those ground roots, uh, ground root efforts of, of trying to, uh, grassroots efforts of trying to figure out what makes our kids tick, what, what's holding them back. When they start to see the things that are holding them back, then they start to really kind of uh, really look at, and they're, as Brad said, they're more open to you. Uh, they'll start to look at their own behavior, what they're doing away from the rink, which is, it's just changing. It's evolving what's holding them back over uh, more and more over the last few years. But what, what's getting them over that is not change. That's, that's a relationship. And I think that uh, um, I have probably in the last three, four years done more um, talking to players at season-ending interviews about what's holding them back and where they can go forward rather than X's and O's and, you know, what they need to do to get better as a hockey player. Most of that has been spent with, you know, what they can start doing mentally uh, to make themselves better. So that, that's probably the biggest change. And, and that always comes back to relationships because they, they have to be open to, to talk about it. Well, that's really interesting that you're talking about that. What you, know, you get the chance to talk to a lot of different players, and I'm sure there's a lot of different answers to the questions, but 
as a whole, is there one thing or a couple different things that you feel like are, are pretty standard in terms of what are holding kids back today from reaching their potential from your conversations that you've had with your players over the past few years? Uh, well, for, for me, I'll, I'll, I'll go. I mean, I, I don't think it is one thing. It's, I think that you know, a lot of kids, uh, a lot of these kids are really mature, but immature and not immature in a bad way. Is that there are a lot of pressure put on these kids, you know, when they're 15, 16, 17, that uh, they're such great players and in a little di different way, they're not allowed to grow up and they got a lot of pressures from their parents or from, you know, junior teams, advisors, of, you know, uh, wanting to be in the NHL to being successful in school, a lot of pressure, you know, to, to, you know, always be a, you know, at the top of their class as far as academically. So I think it's, it's really different. And every, every kid is unique. And for some kids, they want their, they want to be their perfectionist or, you know, for some kids, they have, you know, defense mechanisms that don't, don't allow them to have a real relationships with other kids. You know, for some kids, their fear of failure, you know, uh, it, it's, it, it varies so much with regards to uh, each kid. And that's the unique thing is, is to try to find what it is um, when you start to peel away the layers of that onion, you know, what, what is it really that it can really get them to, as I said, to, because have real relationships because it's, it's, it's our culture is dependent on playing for our teammate. You know, our, our culture is dependent on playing for each other, you know, and, and our university. And to do that, you know, um, I, I just think that uh, uh, what holds guys back is, is uh, so many different areas that uh, you really have to find out what it is. And I tell you what, and once you start going in that direction, uh, that's why I say that it, it, things haven't changed. And I think they've actually gotten better because I think kids will actually open up a little bit more than they would 25 years ago. They'll tell you about their, you know, their problems. They'll tell you about the issues that they have. Not all of them, uh, but the kids that really want to get better, they will. And, and that is to me is, you know, made it a little bit more, uh, I keep going a throwback, you know, it's, uh, uh, the real kids are, they have real conversations and they're throwback kids and other kids that live in that fantasy world of, you know, what their, their Instagram and their, their Twitter handle looks like, you know, it's no different than the, and they're self-absorbed. And, and those are the kind of kids that they existed, you know, back in 1987, 1988, 1995, and 2003. Now they just have more ways to, to, to show that being how self-absorbed they are. Uh, you know, before it was, you know, there was a kid that was really cocky. You know, and now you can see their cockiness and based on how they're living their life. So I don't think things have changed when you really dig down deep. I just think things are different. But, uh, yeah, it's many different things. Yeah, and Coach Barry, how, how about you just in, in getting to know your players more and in, in the conversations that you're having? You know, if you had advice for maybe some kids that will be listening to this that want to go to a Cornell or a North Dakota or play Division One college hockey, you know, what are some things that you think hold them back that they can work on uh, as they're going through their process of getting better? Yeah, you know, I think one of the things when you talk about, you know, the, the two programs we're talking about today, Cornell and North Dakota, those are, you know, those are long story tradition programs that had a lot of success. And I think, you know, when you get recruited to those programs, first go, first thing that goes into a lot of people or a lot of players' minds, not all of them, but some of them go, well, am I good enough to play there? You know, and, and uh, you know, so, some players have a, a swagger or a, a confidence that, yeah, you know what, I, I got this, I, I can do that. And my skill set for uh, shows that but there are some players that uh, go man oh man you know what I, I got to get to that bar and I got to do it every single day and and I think uh, that holds you know some players back a little bit but again I think those are open conversations that you have with players before they even get in here I, I think as coaches you got to say the reasons why they they're coming to Cornell or North Dakota that first of all we believe in you you know this is the role that I we believe that you can play and, and help us win and, uh, and and we'll help you do that so I think you got they got to have the belief that, uh, you know, you're, you're in it with them to get them to where they need to go. And I think that's the first thing. I think Shafe alluded to, there's a lot of different things as far as, you know, what could hold players back. And, and, and he's right. You have to kind of dig into it and try to, try to, you know, peel the layers back to find out what that is and then try to help them get, you know, over that, that hump. And, uh, and that's part of uh, the challenge of coaching, which I think is exciting because it's, it's a psychological thing, not only physical as far as getting them better, but psychological as far as, you know, getting to where they need to go. And, you know, I, I firmly believe that the leadership group is a big part of that. You know, when you identify your good leaders and name them captains, they're an extension of your coaching group. And I know, you know, for us as coaches, we're only in that locker room a, a small percentage of the time compared to what the players are together. So 
you know, having a really good leadership group and help them being mentors to those guys is a big, big deal. And, and again, we worked on that a lot. I know it, I, I don't know what it's like in Ithaca. We're coming out there this fall and we're excited to do that. But in, in Grand Forks, there's not a whole lot of things to do here other than go to school and play hockey. So what we really encourage our guys is to really uh, be, a, be a tight team and do everything together. You know, I know um, um, Fortnite and all this other video stuff is a big deal with kids, but, you know, we really try to say, hey, when we're doing this stuff, let's uh, let's try to, you know, be tight as a team together and do it. And I think that's a big deal of, uh, you know, helping kids, uh, you know, get over what they need to do to get to where they need to go. Yeah, and you mentioned the leadership groups, Coach. What what are some things that you do with your leadership group to? Because I'm a huge believer in that. I think a, a coach is only as good as his leadership group. Um, if they're not bought into what you're doing, I think it doesn't matter who you are, you're screwed. Um, yeah. So what what are some things that you maybe do with your leadership group to help them uh, be a part of that team from that aspect and be an extension of you guys and get other guys to buy in and things like that? Well, first of all, for us, it's. Uh having constant communication with them, not inundate them with meetings all the time, but, you know, whether it's, you know, if you have uh, a captain and three or four assistants, it's, it's either grabbing each of them individually and talking to them and, and asking their opinions, not, you know, taking everything to heart and using everything that what they have for their opinion on, on going forward. But, you know, w when you ask a question and then you listen as a coach, uh, that kind of perks up the ears of any player that, Hey, you know what? The coach is listening to me. And uh, you know what, I might have a little bit of an impact going forward here, but I think it puts the, the player, you know, uh, you know, on the spot or in the spotlight saying, Hey, I, I better have a good answer. I better have a good reason for it, you know, because they might take my opinion into consideration. So, you know, having kind of uh, frequent meetings individually or collectively as a group with our leadership group, just to kind of get a pulse of the team and, uh, and get feedback from them, whether it's, Hey, uh, you know, uh, travel, having, extensive travel and what the week of practice looks like the next week or you know uh going on a road trip and leaving uh one day versus the next day just you know first of all just getting their feedback and that goes a long long way and uh you know I can't say enough about how how much it's you know changed in their fact that I remember in the days when I played college and pro players never got asked uh it was always told you're always told to do something and I think uh you know like I said that goes back into uh the trust and the care factor uh, when you have that going back and forth, uh, uh, that, that I think that builds into a successful group. Yeah, for sure. Coach, how about you? Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, leadership groups have, you know, uh, I, I think that, you know, when we sat down with Brad at the Buffalo, it was really funny because I think that, I think five has had five different ways of addressing our leadership group. And it was, it was kind of intriguing, you know, and I, and I think that, uh, probably we'll go right back to it is that it really doesn't make a difference how you structure your leadership group. I really think it comes back to the kids and, and what you have in that room, because they're going to take that message back to a group of guys. And, and Brad says they're, they're definitely an extension of, of you as a, as a, as a coach. I, I think our leadership group to me starts with our assistant coaches and, you know, I go back to about who they're bringing to campus and um, having kids that are like-minded in the, in the locker room, because, you know, you could have a group of captains that are usually captains are guys that are, are, are really driven. And, and so when they ask, oh, what do you want to do? You know, well, we want to skate in the morning. You know, <laughs> well, okay, let's go. And, you, and but if you don't have like-minded guys in that locker room that also want to skate in the morning or trust those group of guys, um, it doesn't really matter what we do or the coaches do. I, I go back to the culture is, is what's a guy that's not playing to want to do? And what's, you know, and I think that, uh, so I think our assistant coach has done a tremendous job of uh, bringing guys in that are like-minded. Um, the leadership group for me is, is just what Brad said. It, it's just about communication is that when you have a conversation with those guys that they're getting back to every guy in the team, that they're, 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 they're explaining why and how come to, to the, every guy, the guy that doesn't play to the guy that does play, the guy is tired um, and why we're doing it and how come we're doing it. And I think go back to the communication is the so much so important in the leadership group, but um, I think that uh, doesn't matter how you do it. I think it's still what, what Brad said. It comes back to communicating, and then the, the leadership group going back and communicating, and just making a trustworthy decision between the two, and that it's conveyed. To, uh, uh, you know, I like what Brad said. We, uh, what do you say? We, us, and our. I mean, if, if that's not uh, uh, reflective in a leadership group, right? And every decision that you make is for everybody. And, and there's an old saying: is that when you make a decision, 
you know, you always keep the good of everybody in mind of that decision, whether it's personally or for the group. So uh, I totally agree with them. I, I don't think it matters what you're doing and what type of leadership group it is, but I just think that communication is so critical in whatever you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Well, you both mentioned recruiting as a huge piece to that and building your culture, building your leadership groups and, and building your teams. You know, when I was coaching at, at the level and even now outside of it and what I've been able to do, I think the, the biggest question that I get asked is, you know, what are you guys looking for? You know, as, as coaches are sitting in the stands and they're evaluating or they're doing their background work on, on players, you know, from a hockey standpoint and a character standpoint, um, I, I get that. I get that question asked all the time still so here we have the two two guys that have won the the top college hockey coach award this year you know coach Schaefer we'll, we'll start with you you know when you're thinking about evaluating players and the players that you're looking to bring into your program what are a couple different things that are non-negotiables for you that kids have to have to be able to to succeed within your program well I, I, flat out they they got to be able to play for our staff I mean it um, doesn't matter what their talent level is. I mean, they, they got to have the ability to walk in and, and uh, play for our staff. And I guess what that means is that, you know, it, it's just a, a relentless pursuit of, of uh, wanting to get better. You know, you, know, you, you ask what, what, you know, if you give, give advice to kids when, uh, when they want to get to college, you know, I think two things would be, you know, always stay in the present. Uh, young kids always want to look to the future and, uh, you know, never live in fear. And, and so in the recruiting process, I think that looking at kids that, that have that mentality, I've always said some kids love to work uh, or, or like to work. And I think that, you know, working hard is going to be, uh, uh, they always, I never asked a kid, Hey, do you like to work hard? Because we work hard. I've never kid. I said, you know, shake his head saying, no, I don't like to work hard, but there's a difference. You know, do you love to work hard? And I, I think that when we, um, I don't think there was a lot of those attributes were really developed in kids until they're 17 or 18 years old. And that's why I go back to recruiting is to go out and see it actually happen. See them, see them walk into a junior team and, and can they, can they adjust? Can they, you know, uh, continue to get better? Do they have what the it factor? Um, yeah, I've been really happy. Like a few of our recruits that we have come in, in a couple of years, have just been named a, a captains on their junior team. And that, I think that's the kid that the kids we've chosen are the right kids, you know, and so they got to have the basics. I mean, you're not taking a kid that can't skate, doesn't have skill, doesn't, you know, for us, we, you know, size, uh, you know, doesn't really matter. It's the size of how they're, are they going to play big? Um, you know, and are they going to be able to, you know, as I said, have the, the spirit in the hockey sense and the, the hockey sense thing is the, the most difficult, um, you know, to, to really judge. And I, and I think, Again, I go back to the young recruiting. That's where you make your biggest re mistakes is because, you know, some kids are just so much more skilled and faster and uh, are bigger than when they're, when they're 15 and 16 years old. But when everybody catches up, you know, and everybody's the same at 18, 19, it's the hockey sense that, the, that uh, kind of separates. So we're looking for those five things, you know, uh, skill, spirit, size, speed, and uh, hockey sense. So those kind of the, the non-negotiables that we're looking for. And, if we're going to sacrifice on one, he, the person better have a better really have a, a special talent in those other four. And, and uh, uh, but character and uh, culture wise, we're just not looking for players. We're looking for people. And I, I think that that, um, you know, that, that takes a lot longer to decide. And, uh, but that, that is uh, the non-negotiable is, is great people. I mean, and uh, it's evident on recruiting trips. It's evident when you do home visits, how the kids, and their parents relate to each other. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You know, you've been there. You've been in my office when I've had a kid in there and I've walked in, I've seen the parent, the way they talk. <laughs> you, you, you firsthand <laughs> experience me saying, this is your recruit and walk out of the room. See you later. And, <laughs> and uh, how fast I've departed out of that office because I know that they're not coming to Cornell and, and uh, but not, not ignoring those red flags in recruiting. And those red flags are, how the kid talks, how the kid handles himself. I, I'll tell you a story of a kid I, I was sold on uh, the other day as I talked to him and, and reaching out to a lot of recruits because you're at home. And every kid, you know, on the other end of the line was, you know, had certain things. And this kid stopped me and he was a 16 year old kid. He goes, Hey coach, before we get going, I, I just really, really want to tell you how I'm, I'm, I'm happy for you that you're, you're, you're seasoned, but really happy for you as a coach that, uh, you know, you, you were able to, to win a national coach of the year award and share it with a, 
with uh, Coach Barry from North Dakota. And I'm like, what? You know, like it was the first time, you know, and after about 10 calls that the kid actually said he was thinking about somebody besides himself. And uh, I was like, sign me, sign me up on this kid. You know, <laughs> the most mature 16 year old uh, that I've talked to online. And that's, that's not ignoring the, uh, that's, that's seeing what's there in the conversation. And I think that the, uh, I'm fortunate with Ben Sire and Sean and uh, yourself and just guys that have worked for me is to, to not ignore those red flags and not get caught up with the ego of what other schools are looking at and just sticking with what works well for us. Yeah. And Coach Perry, how about you in your guys' recruiting process? What are some things that are important to you? Well, very similar. A lot of those characteristics that Shafe said, but, uh, you know, I think the body of work is the biggest thing. And I think you mentioned it is, you know, every time that you go out and watch a player, I think everybody gets enamored with, kind of the bright shiny things how fast the kid skates and you know how, how skilled he is but I think uh, when you really pull it back I think there's a lot of other, other boxes that have to be checked and, and part of that is you know trying to see this person or player on a regular basis of uh, not just a one-time uh, opportunity to see him on a good night like you know maybe watch him against a better team that's you know a little bit of adversity how are you going to handle adversity and and that really uh, shows the character uh, of, of players and and for us our culture, and, and I know Cornell is the same way, very strong culture, past history and tradition. It's the same with us. And when we walk into a building, you know, I think, I think uh, ju uh, junior coaches or high school coaches know that, hey, uh, you know, do we have a Cornell player or a North Dakota player for you? You know, there, there's a general identity of, of what, when we walk in a building of, of what kind of players we look for. And, and you know, first of all, it's obviously you have to be a very good hockey player in all those different individual areas. But you know, you have to have huge compete. You have to have a team first mentality. And I think body language is a big thing. You know, when we look at skill sets, the other thing we look at is body language. What, what, what's your body language look like in a game when, you, when, you're, when you're winning and when you're losing? And, you know, I, we always love those players when they score a highlight reel goal. The first thing they do is they point to the guy that gave them the puck instead of, you know, uh, ripping their chest or putting their arms <laughs> in the way or skate, skating away from the pile that's congratulating you. You look at that guy that, you know, looks like they did it over and over again, uh, but they point to the guy that passed the puck. And the other thing is adversity. Like, when things are going bad, you know, what do you do? Like, do you, do you try to pick a teammate up on the bench or the goaltender that let in a bad goal or whatever? Those are the little things that we say, you know what, this guy can fit in here. And, uh, and again, uh, we all want to have leaders on our team, guys that are captains of their junior teams. And, and you know, that's a big thing that Shape talks about. But we also want to have guys that are, you know, that'll accept the role. Like I firmly, firmly believe that, you know, you don't, you don't construct a successful team do taking 20 of the best, best players that in, that have the best skill set. You have to construct that. I believe a team that, you know, you, half your team is, is probably high, high end skill. The other half, you know, is it going to accept a, a bottom six forward role or a bottom four D role or, or a backup goaltender role? You have to build your team <clears throat> with a little bit of everything. And you have to have guys that accept that uh, in knowing that they're coming into the program and that's going to be their role. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Well, well moving on, it's kind of similar to these questions. You, know, you guys both mentioned the recruiting aspects and wanting to get high skill level players as well. And both of you had players within this year's roster that made the Hobie Baker top 10. So Cornell, Morgan Barron and Jordan Kaw Kawaguchi at North Dakota. So Shif, I'll start with you on this one. What's it like coaching a kid like Morgan of his caliber, somebody that, you know, I think will have quite a bit of a long NHL career, um, having, having known him and having watched him play. Um, what's it like to coach a kid like Morgan? Well, with, with Morgan, I go back to it. He is an absolute throwback. And I go back to <laughs> as a player, like he is everything that Brad and I have talked about today, like to the T, I mean, and everything. I mean, there's, there, as a, uh, you get back to the, your, when your best player on your on your roster, or one of your best players on your roster, um, has the mentality and lives and breathes it on and off the ice uh, of everything that that Brad and I have talked about today. You, you got a you got a you know a special player and a special team. And I guess what I mean by that is you talk about. I remember our first uh, 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 practice this year. Morgan went down eight a uh, uh, one timer in practice. I'm like, you know, you know, and the guys are looking around, and the young guys are looking around, going, "Wow, you know." And, and um, how he handles the media, as I said, it's just a throwback. He just he loves to play hockey, and he loves to be with his teammates, and 
he doesn't get distracted by anything else than uh, than his than his friends on the team and playing hockey. And it, would he surprise me that he came back to Cornell? It wouldn't surprise me. I mean, do I know that you know the Rangers want him? Uh, there's no question the Rangers want him. They, they probably think he he can play there next year. Would it surprise me to come back that he comes back? Not a, it wouldn't surprise me at all because he's a finisher. I mean, he's a guy that wants to get his degree. He wants to be with his teammates. He wants to. He started something. And he's going to finish it, and um, that's what I mean. It, it's I've never had a player. You know, I've had some really good players, but Brad's probably had some better players than that we've had as far as. But I haven't had a guy that a team stepped out and shadowed on the power play before, like stepped out and stood beside on a power play. I'm like, I've never, I had Matty Molson, who's like one of the most dynamic power play guys I've, I've, I've ever coached. No one ever did that to him. You know, they, they, well, that's because I was out on the ice. Well, they were, <laughs> so, they were afraid, they were afraid you know, of your, my your, muffin of a shot. <laughs> no, they're, they were afraid of your one timer. You know, so <laughs> they knew they couldn't sag on him. Uh, but no, I mean, and, and, and just, uh, I've never, that, that kind of kid that, you know, it didn't matter if you shadowed him or not because he could bully his way to his net. He didn't care if you're, he was being covered. He just didn't care. You know, he just showed up and played. And I tell you what, that, that, that's the culture thing. I go back to its players, and we can talk as much as we want, but when you get a guy like that who just shows up and plays and competes and practices and loves his teammates, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty easy as a coach. And yeah, Coach Barry, how about you? What was it like coaching a, a kid like Jordan Kawaguchi this year? Yeah, I was uh, feel very grateful to to be honest with you. Like uh, you know, when we went through uh, the recruiting process with him, and you know, it was one of those things too. You know, Shape talks about you know trying to get leaders on teams every year, captains. Well, you know, he played in Chilliwack and he was captain of his team, and you know, he was you know, Shape talked about the late bloomers. He he was kind of one of those guys. Like a lot of guys play one or two years of junior and then get to college and try to get to where they want to go. He had to play four years. He played four years in Chilliwack and. And uh, came as a 20-year-old, as, a, as, a, as a, a young man coming into our group here. And I think one of the things that, you know, he had a motivational side of that, you know, he wasn't the bright, shiny toy. He was the guy that had to work hard every single day. And, and uh, you know, he had to prove himself every single day. And, and what I liked about him, too, is he knows that going forward here. You know, he, he came in here, had pretty good two years, had a really good year this year. And, you know, he made the commitment to come back next year, uh, you know, with some unfinished business that we have to do here. And when he said that, then the rest of the group said, yep, I'm coming back too. So that's kind of a big, big deal what a leader does and, and how other people react off of that. And, you know, I think it's one of those things that he's such a humble and hardworking kid. And it sounds like Morgan Barron's the same way, that he'll do whatever the team he's asked uh, from the team as far as doing, and he won't have any questions about it. And, uh, you know, when, when you have a Morgan Barron or, or Jordan Kawaguchi as a coach, he absolutely loves that. Love that because they push the group. They they absolutely raise the level of what everybody else is going to bring to the table, uh, because it's for the good of the team. And I think uh, if we can keep those guys around college as long as we can, uh, that's a that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, as long as you can, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that's good. Well, I got one more question for for you guys. I so much appreciate your time here today and in, in speaking with me. Um, and, and it goes kind of back to, to your guys' programs and who you are. And, and both programs have a very, very, very strong sense of tradition, dating back years and years and years. Uh, so, Coach Barry, I'll, I'll start with you. You talk about team success. You talk about individual success. So many players that have come through the program, like TJ Oshi, Jonathan Tave, Zach Parise. I mean, you just go down the line. How, how do you guys use that sense of tradition in, in building your guys' culture? How much do you talk about tradition? How important is it to you? And, and how do you implement that within what you're doing with your team? Well, first of all, I think tradition has to have a sustainability. It, it, you know, when those players come through to your program, we call it adding to the tradition. We have a big wall that says add to the tradition. And, uh, and, and those guys have. But it's not just about being here those two or three or four years. It's what do you do after? And what I feel really special about is all those guys that you just named, they, they, they communicate back, whether it's with, our, with us as coaches or our, our players here. You know, when, when they're playing in, in NHL venues, the first thing they do after a game is they say, how did North Dakota do? You know, and they, they have a strong connection to our group. And that tells you how tight, you know, tight our, you know, uh, our culture is. And I know it's the same way in Cornell. Um, so, again, having those guys come through our, our program is a big deal. But, you know, going to the other side of it here, like I think everybody looks at those guys' names. What, what's gratifying for me as a coach is when you have a guy like Cole Smith in our group here. I don't know if a lot of people know about him, but, 
you know, he played four years for us. He's a, he's a big kid out of Brainerd, Minnesota. He's six foot four. He was the guy that he had to play all, you know, until uh, exhaust his eligibility in junior. And, uh, you know, what he came to our program as, as a low money guy, as a role player. Ended up this year, he played all situations, five on five power play penalty kill. You know what? This guy is the outlier. He is the guy that you love to cheer for. He ended up getting signing a contract with the Nashville Predators. And, you know, that's what you love about college hockey is you have all those uh, well-known names, but now the obscure guys coming through your program. And I know Cornell is the same way that you get to help these guys on a daily basis of trying to, you know, get their goals and aspirations completed. And, uh, Again, that's a big deal. So, again, like I said, I just feel grateful that uh, you get to touch a lot of players on all different levels. For sure, for sure. And Coach Schaefer, how about you? Well, much like Brad, I mean, living up to the tradition, I think that, uh, um, you know, not, not fearing the tradition. I think that's what, you know, you know that we talk about that a lot is that, uh, um, you know, not to, to worry about what people have done before you, but to uh, blaze, blaze their own trail and, you know, you, you know, Topher, you know that we have our guys research their numbers at, at different times to find out who is the best player to ever wear the number and, you know, try to live up to that That when fans look out and they see a guy, you know, um, that, that played maybe before him, that they, they want to live up to that excellence, but also at the same time, um, you know, they, they also want to try to un unseat that guy, you know, and, and can they be the guy that, you know, um, you know, someday in 10 years, someone else is voting for him and to put his name on the back of that jersey as the best player. And, and we've had a lot of success with that, but uh, we keep the trophies in our room, um, you know, just above that stalls. And, you know, it's tough because I think the whole motto of our program is to live in the present and worry about it in the process. And that is, is to focus on it on a day-to-day -day to get better. But I think when they bring, we bring these, the, the, the tradition back, you guys come back what Brad says and they talk about it. I think if you if if you have a culture that where you're playing for each other, just what Brad said, that lives with you forever, you know. And it's always about the journey; it's never about the result. And and when guys uh, have that kind of experience where they're they've met their best friends uh, for the rest of their life, uh, no matter where they go from there on out, um, I think that you've done your job as a coach. And you know that that is the tradition that we definitely want to uphold. If if, if we're pursuing excellence. And we better be doing it the right way so that they are always be the best friends and you know, always think of Cornell as a place where it changed their life. And um, so, I mean, it, 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 is, it is about winning, but it's also about that experience. I think it's going to be even more about the experience with the, all these transfers and, and the portal and guys being able to go wherever they want. Everybody keeps asking, well, what about how's that going to affect? I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to put programs like ourselves in North Dakota on, on a, on a, on a, in a better light because – if you're if you have that kind of tradition where you're playing for each other, guys don't want to leave. And if they do, you may might be the guy that you don't want in the first place, and and uh, just couldn't fit in. But I, I think it's going to put even more of an emphasis on the things that we talked about: winning tradition, winning culture, um, and that that uh, that culture is all about again about relationships, how how guys got along. Well, for sure. I mean, I've got on a couple different text chains of guys I played with at Cornell, and it's always the same stuff. You know, now we're you know, instead of doing stupid pictures to each other, we're sending pictures of our kids and, and things like that. And it's, uh, it's a huge part of it. And, and uh, I know obviously being a part of it at Cornell and, and knowing guys that went to North Dakota and how special it is there. I mean, very, very cool and, and incredible that I think it's just really cool. The, you guys talk about blazing the path. I mean, blazing the path, there is that huge strong tradition and you have to be strong enough as a person and as a player to, you know, want to fit into that and want to add to that, but then also leaving your mark, I think is such a cool thing. Do you guys talk about that a lot? Obviously in your guys' answers you did, but how important is it to, you know, have kids there that really want to leave their mark, not for their own careers, but leave the mark there for North Dakota and leave the place better than you found it. How, uh, Coach Barry, how about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. I think that last statement that you said, leave the place better than you found it. That has to be a concept that you, that you love is when players come through here. And, uh, and, and that's a big deal. Our players talk about that all the time. And, you know, when you, you, you win, I think that's the, the culmination of everything. But I think having that lifelong experience of building those relationships and of, uh, you know, whether you go to the highest level in hockey or whether you leave with a great four-year degree uh, to get you off and a great start in life, that's a big, big deal. And, uh, and again, like I said, it's, it, it's one of those things that you got to make sure you have the right people sitting on the right seats on the bus. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it, it's a great ride. And uh, again, uh, looking forward to the, 
this upcoming year on that too. Yeah, for sure. Coach Schaefer, how about you? We'll end it with you. Brad's got the same line, man. Boy Scout, leave, leave the place better than you found it. <laughs> you know, there's, it's just what as simple as that. But, you know, I think that uh, I go back to it. Like, you, you know, it was fun talking to Brad at, at Buffalo because you hear about, a lot about these sayings. Like, you've heard a lot about the culture and talk about it. It's another to, to you know, everything that we do is, is about that, right? You, I mean, you can say the coaches convention, listen to a guy, talk about you, and that, that's easy. It's not easy to drive the culture that, that we have. And it's not easy for the players to buy into that culture. You, know, you sit in here, we've, we've talked for about an hour and, and, and uh, we've talked about all the things you're like, you know, if I'm sitting there and going, why, why, why can't other programs do this? Like, you know, why, why aren't other people doing this? And it, it isn't easy. It's not for the faint of heart, you know, especially for the kids. And, and uh, you know, and I think that, uh, I think that that's why I respect about Brad, um, you know, and just uh, said, you know, to see him and share a, a coach of the a year award with him, it, it, it's it's special. I, I know how he runs his program. I know how he he uh, treats his assistant coaches. I know how he handles himself uh, at the convention and seeing him on the road in the rink. And so it's an honor. But it, you know, it's no mistake that they got great culture, and uh, it, it's not an easy thing easy thing to do. You got to live it. And, and we have our challenges, and and those challenges are you know are year by year. But yeah, it's leave leave the place better than you found it. But Man, to get to get the kid to think that way and do those things, um, you know, it, it's it's never assumed that it's just going to happen again next year. I'm sure Brad's sitting there, and I'm sitting here you know, over the last few weeks thinking about, you know, we, we're going to have brand new kids, and and how how are we going to get back to that special sweet spot that we were probably both at right at the end of the year, where all cylinders were clicking. You know, to get there is a man. I'm not I'm not you know, it starts day one, not assuming that our, our freshmen or any of our returning players, they, they know anything about Cornell hockey and, uh, and start all over. And that's the, that's the special part. Absolutely. Coach Barry, any final words before we let yeah. you guys go oh, here? A couple things, uh, you know, that, that last comment really resonated with me with uh, coach Schaefer there. Uh, accountability, you know, we, that word really hasn't come up, but I think that's a big deal within both cultures here. And, you know, I go back to, I know how he runs his group and, and how direct, uh, and caring that he is with his guys, but going down to Florida in those meetings, and you know when Coach Schaefer stands up in those meetings and and, and says comments, it it resonates, and it it's because it's direct, and it's making everybody else accountable, and that's a big big deal. When you have to have tough conversations, or when you have to, you know, pull everything into line, whether it's your group or whether it's a, a body of coaches, it it resonates, and that's how you drive culture is the accountability factor. So that that's what I leave it with. And again, I, I feel grateful and honored to be uh, in the same sentence with uh, Coach Schaefer on this national award. And uh, you know, we always say not any individual awards is because of your team. And he mentioned his assistants, and it's the same with ours, our staff and assistants, and and the players that drove it. So that's that's kind of the driver of that. And the very last thing is, hey, Topher, you do an unbelievable job. Uh, watch you on Twitter. And uh, in the things that you do on that hockey think tank, I think that's outstanding. I learn from it every single day. I look at that. So keep doing that. You do a great job. And Shave, thanks again. We're uh, looking forward to coming out to Cornell uh, to uh, revive our uh, tradition and history of getting both programs together. Just promise me one thing. Can you leave a few tickets for our fans at your rink? <laughs> they, they'd love to get into your rink. We, we haven't been there in a long time. Not a, not a chance. Uh, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Especially if they have, if they're from Long Island, there's going to be no extra tickets going up to Long Island. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you two so much. Uh, incredible, incredible seasons, incredible people. Uh, I've had a blast over this hour, but obviously been in rinks with both of you uh, down in Florida and, and getting to know you and stuff like that. So um, keep up the great work and uh, can't wait to, to see what you guys have in store for everybody next year and hopefully able to, uh, to finish the job. It's been a tough Tough last couple of months, I'm sure, for you guys and, and your players not being able to finish it. But uh, fantastic seasons, and thank you so much for taking the time today. Thanks, Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, take care.